there that uh, you, you all have a, a lot more headaches to go through with deep sky imaging in both the capture and the processing than in lunar imaging. Although um, it does get dramatically more difficult when you expand your field of view. And especially if you start talking about mosaics, which I'll spend some time talking about today. I think what I'll do here is I'll just go ahead and share my screen. So, and can everyone hear me okay? I'm always- Yeah, I, I am a sure. that. Okay. Okay, so I, um, let's see. So I, yeah, I, I have this uh, second monitor here and it's supposed to be sharing the, the second monitor. So I don't have any way to verify this, but are people seeing a, a slide deck up here? Yeah, looks fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, I guess two things I'll point out. I don't know to what degree this will matter, but uh, I think earlier I heard someone mention the, um, so these three dots, if you look at your, um, you know, your settings, I don't know to what degree this, this matters, but um, if you go to the settings menu and go to video, you know, the default, it sets it to, um, 360p for receiving, and you can change that to high definition 720p, uh, which is still low definition, by, you know, by real standards, but it's the best that Google Meet has. Um, I'm keeping mine on 360 because I'm not actually receiving, and you know, I'm, I'm doing the presenting, so I want to save my internet bandwidth, but uh, you may want to consider bumping this up. Whether or not it would have any difference on the images, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, suffice it to say that unfortunately the one drawback to these virtual presentations is, you know, as you know, it, it destroys image quality. So some of these things I'll have, you'll have to just take my word for changes that you see in an image that may not be showing up. Uh, if you see really, really horrendous artifacts, it's, I can assure you it's uh, not in the, in the raw image that we're looking at. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is again to, um, once I, I'm going to start this presentation here. Um, so I'm going to stop my camera because it just causes needless use of data and uh, causes my computer to overheat. Um, but people can still, yeah, it, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I probably won't be monitoring the chat. So if people see questions coming up, definitely uh, someone speak up and let me know because it always makes it more fun if there's questions in real time uh, so we don't build up too many as we go along. But uh, with that, I'm going to, let's see, I'm just going to turn that camera off. And it's up to you whether to, you know, when we go full screen, there's probably a setting option in there to um, yeah, change layout, sidebar, my, I think spotlight, if you click spotlight, it just puts it on, it gets rid of everyone's faces. So that's also something to, to play around with. But with that, I will start. And so I have some slides prepared and then also I'll be going into various uh, uh, softwares to just show some examples of processing as we go along. But again, it's impossible to cover uh, everything. And so really this is just sort of a primer to, to lunar imaging. So feel free to jump in with, with any questions. Um, so I, obviously I'm Tom Glenn, I'm happy to be here and uh, share what I like about imaging the moon, which of course, uh, is a hated object by many people in uh, deep sky imaging. So I certainly won't be able to convince you to like the moon at the expense of your deep sky imaging. But when the moon is available, it does present for some interesting opportunities. Even in this image here, you know, part of what I like about the moon is just since it is so close, you can see amazing geography and small features right from your own backyard uh, with certainly no consideration whatsoever for light pollution since the moon itself is equivalent to strong light pollution. Um, but just, just to point out, I mean, so Clavius, this crater over here, everyone's familiar with. I like this crater here, Mortis. Um, so this is a five kilometer deep crater and the central peaks are three kilometers tall. Uh, just the scale of these features is, is quite amazing. And for example, this mountain up here, if you can see kind of my my arrow moving around. This is about six kilometers uh, above the local terrain. So rising higher above the local terrain than even Mount Everest above the Tibetan plateau. So really uh, unbelievable stuff from a geographic uh, point of view. Point of view. Um, so a brief outline of what I'm going to discuss. And a lot of this will 
blend together. Um, but uh, sort of just a brief introduction into who I am and why I like lunar imaging. So I'm, I'm going to include some example uh, example images that I like. Um, I'll talk briefly about equipment considerations and then go into some details on capture considerations, stacking and deconvolution, and then post-processing. And I do a lot of mosaics um, since I, one of the things I like is just getting wide fields of view at reasonably high resolution. So I'm imaging with a C925 Edge HD. So it's a moderate size aperture. It's not huge. And you don't have to search hard to find images of higher resolution th that other people take. Um, so I, I try to make up for lack of a huge instrument by covering large pieces of terrain on the moon. So I do a lot of mosaics. And at the end, if we have time, uh, I can talk about map projections, which is another interesting thing I like doing with data. And then if there's still some time, I can briefly touch on color imaging of the moon. Although I don't do much color imaging of the moon. Most of my images are all grayscale taken with a monochrome camera. But uh, just really brief. So I'm a research scientist. I uh, trained in biology, uh, went to Duke uh, in North Carolina for undergrad, and then to Stanford, uh, where I got a PhD in developmental biology. And I'm currently at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies near San Diego. So uh, for astronomy, this is a hobby that I picked up fairly recently. I didn't own a telescope until 2015. And uh, Although th this picture here, uh, so this was at my, my family's house in South Carolina, the 2017 uh, solar eclipse. Uh, so at this point in time, I did have a telescope, but I wasn't traveling with it. Uh, so I, this is just a representative image of uh, what I was doing, even with my scopes at the time before I got into more serious imaging. Like everyone or most people, I was holding my phone up to eyepieces and was sort of amazed at what you could do, um, despite the frustrations involved in doing that. So I quickly moved into sort of more specialized imaging and I almost exclusively do solar system imaging uh, purely based on convenience and time. Uh, so uh, I can do this from my backyard without worrying about light pollution. And um, I was just sort of amazed at, at what you can see with planets. I, you know, I, I won't, talk about this image today. I've given other presentations on this, but I, some of you may have seen uh, the image I took of the International Space Station transiting Mars. So I like doing things that are somewhat technically challenging and offer a unique image that maybe people haven't seen too many examples of before. Um, but uh, my primary purpose today is to just talk about some of my observations with uh, lunar imaging. And so shown here is another example of uh, an image I like. I like all regions of the moon, but of course the this southern highlands region is especially beautiful with a lot of rugged terrain. Um, and in fact, this is the larger image that are, the cropped version of this was on the, the title page. Um, here is another image showing the Tresnecker and Hygienus Riles that uh, Kevin was talking about and almost also uh, Rima Aridaeus. So just a lot of interesting topography that you can image. Now, when, when I first got started, I was actually using this scope here that I got from a, a friend of mine secondhand. It's a, a 4.5 inch Mead Newtonian that is, you know, a step above department store level telescope. It's a real telescope, but it was, uh, it's not great. It was kind of beat up. You can see the, I had to use duct tape to hold together the, the secondary assembly here. Um, amazingly, it, it actually produced some decent images, but I, uh, after about a couple of years of playing around with this, I got a C925 Edge HD, which is primarily what I image with now. Although um, I do have a, a Newtonian, kind of like the Mead, but this one's a six inch and it's a higher quality than the, the Mead was. Uh, it's The brand is TPO, which is sort of a rebranded GSO scope. The optics are, are very decent. And although shown here is an image of Saturn, I, I use this for wider fields of view, such as lunar eclipses. And also with my ASI-183, you can fit the entire moon into a single frame, uh, which is, is useful. But 
most of my images uh, that I'm going to be talking about today are taken with the C925 Edge HD. This image here was actually taken on a, an outing where I was at a more remote site, but most of my imaging is just right from my backyard since you don't need uh, to worry about light pollution uh, for the moon, certainly. And so the combination that I'm using is the ASI 183 monochrome camera with the scope and that comes out to an image scale of 0 0.21 arc seconds per pixel at f10 and that's almost exclusively what i'm i'm shooting with uh, i do have an asi 224 uh, another zwo camera that has a much smaller field of view much smaller sensor but faster frame rates and i use that for planets and when i was first starting i did use that for the moon and it works very well um, but i uh, decided I really wanted a larger field of view. So this, uh, I'm just going to go through some examples of images that I like and th things that I like about lunar imaging. So this is just another example of the Southern Highland region. Uh, this image was actually an APOD last uh, February, about a year ago, I believe it was, um, and it shows again one of my favorite regions of the moon. Uh, Although you can't tell from this image, uh, this is a mosaic that you can zoom in on at reasonably high resolution. Um, so zooming in on the Copernicus region along the, the Terminator, it sort of looks like a black hole where giant impact, um, just a, a pretty cool shot. Uh, I frequently like using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website to compare just what types of features are resolvable in my images compared to actual orbital images. And so this is just a blow up of an interesting region that some of you may be familiar with the Hortensius domes region. And sure enough, you can see a lot of the domes um, in this image. Uh, the one on the left, of course, is the satellite image from the LROC, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. I also, uh, I like paying attention to libration. So libration is always a topic that somewhat confuses people, but the, the, essentially the moon appears to wobble in both latitude and longitude uh, throughout its orbit. And this has to do uh, with the fact that the orbit of the moon has slightly variable velocity. And also there's a slight inclination of the orbit with, with respect to earth. And so we can peer over the north and south poles at times and also the eastern and western limb and so this is an image of the uh, far western limb uh, looking at Mare oriental um, which is a one of the uh, maria that is sort of straddling the the near side and the far side and this is just a, a view of the same region taking on, taken on a, a different occasion again with strong libration and I labeled a few of, of the features here. And so what I like about paying attention to libration is you can get examples of uh, regions of the moon that are not so often seen or certainly less often than, than the more popular regions. And I mentioned at the end, uh, if there's time, I can go through in a little more detail my method for producing map projections, but in the event that there's not time, I just had sort of a brief summary slide here. We can revisit this, but many of you may be familiar with uh, Winjupos, which is used in planetary imaging for derotation of images, but it also uh, has very useful features for making maps. And essentially you can define control points of known latitude and longitude and assign them uh, those corrected latitude and longitudes. And then you can make a map projection. And so this is what a cylindrical uh, projection of that region would look like. And so on the left, of course, you run out of data because we don't have it, uh, we can't see this from Earth anymore, but nevertheless, you can see the basin of Mare Oriental. And for comparison, this is a, you know, the actual satellite image taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showing, of course, the full basin since they don't have the same problems that we have here. Um, but again, I find it fascinating to sort of make these projections and, and compare them. In this example, this should animate. It, it's always unclear how things will work through these virtual meeting environments. But I, uh, I think that this was back in 2018. Um, 
on several occasions, I've been able to image the moon on two consecutive days, and then you can align the images. And of course, you see the movement of the Terminator uh, separating night and day uh, down at the bottom. But also you can see if you align the limb, which I did here, you can see apparent rotation, in this case, kind of down into the left. Um, and, and that's from changing libration from one day to the next. And if you take a look at the same animation, but zoom in on the limb, in the Mare Oriental region, you can see just one single day, the libration changing, especially if you look at the mountains on the limb, it has the appearance as if the moon is rotating. And this is due to a very slight change in perspective uh, that we see from Earth. And as I said, this is also true in the polar regions. So this crater Rashtad's Vensky, which uh, certainly would be a candidate for one of the more difficult craters to spell um on the moon and i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly but this is actually a far side crater across the north pole so the north pole of the moon would be right here in in the vicinity of uh where my cursor is um and so this crater is is on the opposite uh, on the far side but just across the pole and so with two consecutive days you can actually see the sun rising on the central peak of uh, this crater even though the sun is setting on the main line of the Terminator on the near side of the moon here. Uh, another example of libration, you can see the dates on these images separated by uh, several months, different phases, same region of the moon. Note the position of, so Clavius, this crater here, much closer to the limb in this example than in this example. And if you've ever tried to align images of the moon taken on different dates, even if they're very close together um, in date, you, you can, you, you'll quickly notice that the images are non-superimposable and this is due to changing perspective. Although if you do a map projection in Winjupos, you can somewhat correct for this. I say somewhat because there's still distortion that's really impossible to get around when you're imaging at such an oblique angle. Um, but I made this blinking animation showing uh, sunrise versus sunset seen on Clavius. And when I went back and looked, I, I have a lot of images of, of this region. So I could sort of make a, a in, this, in this case, it's a cylindrical projection. And if you look closely, you can see some distortion where the images still don't perfectly align, but by doing a cylindrical map projection, they align much better than if you had just tried to overlay them without correcting for uh, perspective. So this now is looking at the uh, other limb of the moon. So we looked at Mare Oriental a few images ago, and this is now looking at the southeastern limb of the moon so that the south pole is actually down here uh, where my my arrow is and this region up here is Mare Austral, um southern sea which is uh, often visible from earth although with libration you get very different uh, views of it so this particular libration was very strong in both the south and the east direction and so it allowed the visibility of craters that are rarely seen so this crater here jenner um, is on the far side of the moon. So it's across the 90th um, meridian. So I think it's at about 95, 96 degrees east. And you can see um, this peak here that I labeled, because it's so tall, this peak again, hard to appreciate from here, but it's some six kilometers above the local terrain. And if you go to actual uh, maps, you can find it and it's at nearly 110 degrees east. And so with libration, you can see considerably farther than the 90th meridians um, east and west. This is just more of the, the same image looking at the South Polar region. And a few years ago, um, I, I had annotated this. And a lot of these posts are, I, I post frequently on cloudy nights. And so if you search for my name in South Pole, you can find some annotated versions I did uh, of these images. So. Uh, Shackleton is the actual South Pole, so that it's a, a crater here, and the South Pole, the true South Pole is on the rim of Shackleton here. And because of libration, we can see over and beyond Shackleton here, although sometimes you can't even see Shackleton at all, even if you're looking at the exact right region, because it is just out of view due to libration. And just another 
annotated version moving a little bit to the east in this case, including features such as uh, part of Crater Sikorsky and uh, Vala Schrodinger, which is a far side uh, feature that is sort of barely visible here. You, you'd never know what this is without, I, I cross-reference this to satellite images and check latitude and longitude. So you, you can't really resolve any real depth to the feature here, but nevertheless, uh, it's way out there across technically on the far side. So these are just some of the things that I like doing with these images. And um, just as a, an example of what I've done recently, uh, combining images from different dates, this is again, the South Pole taken at a, a different phase. Shackleton is indicated here. And so I realized that I had imaged the moon at two very different librations, one strongly to the east and one to the west, um, and on both to the south, uh, spanning about a three-year period. And so I was able to uh, map project those and create a, a stereographic polar projection of the South Pole, which is shown here. And if you zoom in, it may be a little bit hard to see, but I labeled a, some of the craters in and around the South Pole. And you can see how much of the moon, um, let's see here below, yes, this, these are the 90th uh, meridians east and west. And you can see a certain fraction of the moon is visible beyond those due to uh, libration again. And it's always fun to kind of spot check uh, the accuracy of these maps. Of course, there's inherent inaccuracy in them because the data itself uh, has limitations. But if you compare the, the map I made on the right, just zooming in on the Clavius region to a USGS map that was produced using LRFC data, just on a gross level, uh, checking latitudes and longitudes, it's uh, from my perspective, remarkably accurate just for something that was produced in the backyard. Um, so um, that's sort of the end of the slideshow. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uh, capture considerations and uh, processing now. So to just how, how would we create these images? So my first sort of advice is use what you have. You know, as I said, when I first started, I was just holding up my iPhone to the eyepiece of telescopes. And with the moon, that actually works pretty well because you can take fairly decent uh, low magnification shots for sure. And there's even people out there that have done some very nice higher magnification images. It's limited compared to what you can do with a real uh, astronomy camera, but nevertheless, uh, don't discount just holding up your phone to the eyepiece. So aperture controls resolution, although I would say that most people underestimate their equipment. So even my C925 Edge HD, which I would consider a moderate aperture telescope, but certainly not huge, uh, is capable of, of very fine resolution on the moon, but we rarely have the atmospheric conditions to support that. So a lot of people get frustrated with their images and they think it's an equipment problem, but really it's a seeing problem combined often with an experience and uh, uh, processing and, and just overall technique problem. So whatever scope you're using, it's important to match the camera to that telescope. Um, and this doesn't have to be overly complicated. Uh, on the moon, you can of course image at a wide array of image scales, but I wouldn't recommend excessively sampling. And by excessive, I would typically mean anything more than 5X the pixel pitch in microns. So if you know the pixel pitch of the camera, so in, in my case, it's 2.4 microns. If you multiply that by five, you get F12. So I wouldn't want to be imaging at any more than F12 with my camera. And my scope is F10, so it's pretty much a, a perfect match. The, there's actually not a meaningful difference if you look at the images between those two focal ratios. Uh, and I've even used low power bar lows to test this and there's just, there's no improvement to be had. Um, so I recommend uh, just sticking with something about 5X the pixel pitch of your camera, but it doesn't have to be exact. You know, the, it rarely is exact, but if you're exceeding that by large amounts, then you're just going to blow up the image without any meaningful increase in resolution. So the other consideration is wavelength. So as I said, I'm imaging with a monochrome camera, uh, which allows me uh, to use whatever filters I want. Uh, a lot of people will image in IR, and that 
can be a good thing. Uh, but the deeper you go into IR, the lower your resolution gets and your exposure starts to become unfavorable because less light is getting through. And so I typically, in good seeing, I actually use a green filter. And in anything from good to average seeing, I will use a, a 610, uh, 610 nanometer long pass a combination red and IR filter. I see a lot of people having success with the 685 nanometer filter. There's really, you can use almost any filter you want on the moon. Um, but just keep in mind that the deeper you go into IR, you will be cutting into resolution and your exposure. So uh, collimation and focus are extremely, extremely important. And I'm not really gonna spend any time on that. Uh, today, I'm gonna assume that people that uh, have scopes that require collimation know how to do this, but certainly there are a lot of tutorials online to describe that. But if your scope, uh, particularly reflectors that need to be collimated, if they're not, then that's gonna severely limit your image. Likewise, if your focus is not good, that will severely limit the image. And on the moon, uh, I recommend focusing directly on the moon. So as you saw in the example images I showed you, certainly if you go to the Terminator, there is no shortage of very high contrast features to focus on. And that's a far better way to focus in live view and looking at the actual result and finding the sharpest focus versus trying to do something like use a mask on a star and, and then move the scope that uh, generally no one in solar system imaging really does that method. So uh, uh, particularly with the moon, it's very easy to find things to focus on. So I'm gonna, uh, this is just a reminder to me, I'm gonna exit the slideshow here and just show you a couple of websites that I like using for planning lunar imaging. So just a second here. Okay, so the first is this, if hopefully people are seeing now um, this webpage. So every year uh, NASA comes out, so the Scientific Visualization Studio comes out with this moon phase and libration calculator, they call it dial -a moon If you just Google search for dial -a moon uh, you'll find it and it even goes back almost 10 years. So you, you can find this for a lot of years, but for example, to the hour, this is the moon right now. Um, you know, if we wanna know what it's gonna look like, you know, let's see, on March 4th, there we go. Let's go to, since we are um, currently in this nearing spring, uh, and so in the Northern hemisphere, the first quarter moon is highest in the sky right now. So uh, actually in the next few weeks, you have a few weeks of a break here where it's low declination, but uh, it, it will be coming back up high. Let's see, you can just type. So this is just useful for planning. So here it is on, on March 20th. Um, you have a number of some information here. And of course the time is universal time. So you have to convert that, but you get phase, the size, distance, um, Interest, some interesting data points. Uh, so of course the declination, so you can see that on this particular date, it's at 23 degrees declination. So it's very high, you know, for me, uh, it'll rise over 80 degrees. So getting very close to Zenith during these favorable periods. The sub earth point, longitude and latitude, that's your libration. So the more extreme these numbers are, a number around zero means you're at a mean zero libration but in this case, uh, negative four, so to the west for longitude. Uh, so libration and longitude can vary from about plus or minus eight degrees and in latitude by about plus or minus 6.8 degrees. So these are just things to consider. The other nice thing is if you click the image, it actually takes you to a higher resolution that you can zoom in a bit on and they've labeled some features for you. And this is a simulated image created with uh, at very accurate shadows using LRO uh, laser altimeter data. So this is useful for a variety of reasons. It's useful for planning and it's also useful for processing uh, in case you kind of lose sight of what the moon was supposed to look like at that time. Because sometimes the processing, uh, when you're doing a large mosaic, the tonal distribution, it, it's nowhere near as complicated as deep sky imaging, but nevertheless, uh, things can get a little out of control if you don't sort of stay grounded in reality of what the moon actually looked like at the time. So that's one website. Uh, 
that I, I, I like a lot. The other one. Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, this is John Soak. A quick question, I, and I think it'll help the group too. When I sure. shoot uh, planets and the moon, I, I normally do what you describe. I focus on a star and then I go to the planet. But for the moon, I, I do use the moon and I eyeball it. Um, do you have a recommended way that's maybe digital or through software to focus on the moon? Or do you just recommend sticking on your glasses and looking through the diopter or, or, yeah. or focusing yeah. manually? Like yes. how would... Right. So I... Um... I'll give you an example in a few slides when we get to the, the capture details on, I, it's difficult to show with animations, but I have a few videos or a little animated GIFs showing uh, the live view. So I definitely just eyeball it uh, on the screen going to somewhere between 100% and 200% image scale um, in the live view of fire capture. And I should say though, it really depends like everything else in imaging on the scene conditions. So if the scene conditions are poor, you're not gonna be able to get a good focus because one doesn't exist. There's just too much turbulence. If you, if you ever get really good seeing, it's surprisingly easy to focus if you go to these features near the Terminator or something suitably bright that has contrast and you just slowly go in and out of focus and you find you have to do it by eye, but it's similar to the you know the way a camera, uh, like a phase or a contrast detection autofocus. So yes, it would be nice if there was something to do this for you, but I don't know of anything in the planetary or lunar imaging community that is better than just eyeballing it. But it all just depends on on your scene conditions, and it helps too. Uh, so I don't have a motorized focuser, but I just haven't bought one yet. But that can help because you can um, rack in and out of focus, but do it electronically. And some of them will have readouts for you in microns of how far above and below a focal plane you were. And you can take note of that and then zero in on, you know, write something down and return to it. So you could definitely do that. You know, if you have a, a larger budget, there's certainly a lot of really nice electronic uh, focusers with, with readouts. Um, but the actual focusing itself still has to be done by eyeball, at least in my opinion. Thanks. Okay. Um, so this is the, the quick LRO quick map. So the quick map .lroc .asu .edu. So this is super useful for checking a variety of, of things. Let me just make this full screen. Um, Anytime you're interested in a feature, you know, I won't linger on this because we have other things to cover, but you can just zoom in anywhere, you know, on the moon. So here's Tycho, for example. You, I would recommend going to this website if you like the moon because there's so many things you can play around with. So I'll just leave that up to you to figure out, but you can change the projection. For example, you could go to lunar globe and then you can rotate this around in any direction that you want. Um, and, and basically anywhere on the lunar surface, you can just zoom in. So of course, central peaks of Tycho, um, just amazing resource. So I, I spent a lot of time uh, just playing around with this website. Uh, there are, you know, South Polar Projection, this crater Mortis that I talked about before. If you go over here on the left to the draw search tool, you can draw a line between any two points and it'll give you an elevation readout with laser altimeter data. So you can see the rim here and the central peak here. If you click show detailed data, you get the actual profile line here. So just a lot of, you know, there's tons of stuff. So I'm not gonna linger on this. You can play around with this, but this is very useful for checking features on images and measuring things. Uh, and for getting exact latitude and longitude coordinates if you did want to make a map. Uh, so for example, wherever you hover the cursor over, uh, you can see in the lower left of this screen, there's a latitude and longitude readout for you down, down in this region here. Okay, so that covers useful websites. So let me just make a few comments on the image capture itself. So I should say that and I'll enter, make this full screen again. Okay, so this is an image I had years ago, uh, you know, so obviously it wasn't taken specifically for this presentation. Um, so it's not 
meant to be like the best possible exposure or anything like this, but just some things to consider as Kevin said at the beginning, as long as you haven't blown out the histogram, um, it's difficult to mess up the capture it, itself. Uh, so, and I'll have a few more comments on that on the next slide, but this is just a screenshot from fire capture. This is what I use. I know that a lot of people use sharp cap. I think they're pretty much equal, but you need some type of capture software to run the camera to your laptop. So despite the fact that this example is, you can see the checkbox up in the upper left, it says 16 bit. The camera only has a 12 bit uh, sensor, but you have to check that box if you want to capture 12 bit because it's recorded as a 16 bit file. However, as I'll tell you on the next slide, I've done extensive testing and shown that it's almost never worth capturing those 12 or 16 bit files versus eight bit. Uh, for reasons that I can talk about on the next slide, but this one was captured in that, in that mode. Oh, sorry, my screen just, uh, okay, went to sleep, all right. Uh, so in this particular case, I was using my uh, F6 Newtonian. So as I said, the entire moon fits in one uh, field of view with the ASI-183. And so the reason gain is zero here, I, I don't normally even recommend using gain zero, but at F6 with a gibbous moon, this uh, an eight millisecond exposure. Um, this is just what I did. So, hey Tom, can we uh, interrupt just for a second? Yeah, uh, sure. You're, you're, when you when you something happened to your screen there a second ago, I think you noticed it. And right now oh. we we only at least I don't see your screen anymore. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, I see. It probably Google Meet might have canceled it. Yeah, let me just reactivate this. Yeah, thanks for definitely speak up because when I'm in full screen mode, I can't tell that. But for some reason, when my screen went to sleep, it uh, it exited my my sharing. So this should go back. Let's see. There, that's got it now. Okay, cool. Yeah, definitely. Please let me know if that happens again, or sure. if any if there's any weird audio problems. Because sometimes you know I do these meetings a lot for work. And sometimes when long periods of time go by and you're just talking into your screen, you hope that, oh man, I <laughs> hope I'm not just talking to myself and I've been alone for the last 20 minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the feeling, yeah. No, yeah. The, other, other than that, everything's been fine. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so, uh, and I'll mention this again on the next slide. There's no hard and fast rule on exposure. So there's, you have the liberty to do a lot of different things. You could do, you know, like in this example, very low gain. And also this is not a long exposure. This is a fast scope. So this is the combination, but obviously if you bump the gain up, you could bring this exposure down. So you just kind of have to find um, wh what you want to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but the important things are the histogram. So uh, whether it's a 12-bit a, a histogram shown here or a, an 8-bit histogram, you just want to make sure that it's not reading 100%. So sometimes there's confusion when we talk in lunar or planetary imaging about a histogram fill percentage. And in the deep sky community, when you're talking about a histogram fill, you're usually talking about the main peak of the sky fog. Um, that's not what we're talking about um, with an image like this. When I talk about a histogram percentage, I'm talking about the absolute brightest pixels. So in this case on the moon, you know, Proclus is particularly bright over here. There's a, uh, Stevanus and Fernurius, these super bright, they can sometimes be annoying if they saturate your images. But fortunately, in fire capture, and I'm sure sharp cap, it gives you a readout here. So in this case, there's those bright points, and I don't know which one's the brightest point in this case, but whichever one that is, it's only 85% of my histogram. And so I generally recommend something around 75%. Um, you can go a little higher. I've certainly gone a little higher, but then you run the risk of having clipping occur during uh, deconvolution. Some of this depends on your scene conditions too. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the scene itself is a form of noise. If you define each pixel in the image as having a certain tonal intensity from black to white, turbulence will cause that to fluctuate. So if you have poor seeing, the histogram can actually show that sometimes. If you have wild fluctuations between 75% and 100% saturation without changing your exposure, then you know your, your seeing is not so stable. Um, but in this case, if it's stable, it might only move from 85%, to, you know, 
down to 82 or up to 88, something like that. But you just want to, you don't want to be cutting it too close to 100% because you need to save a little room so that when you sharpen the image, you're not saturating anything significant. There's always a few pixels saturated. You can't worry about every tiny pixel or else you'll compromise your exposure. But you certainly don't want there to be any meaningful uh, saturation in the raw image or your highlights will be blown out. Um, let's see. So I also, let me just, so yeah, go to this next slide. Since hey, Tom, can I, can I ask one question about the last slide before you, before sure. you ask that? It's, maybe that it's the same slide that. here. Yeah. Um, sure. so the, uh, uh, the, the way you're capturing, you're capturing video in SER format. Uh, have yes. you noticed any difference between capture in SER and capture as AVI? Not if you have a small file. So there's a couple of uh, caveats here. So in general, the answer is no. However, uh, I capture in these SDR files for several reasons. First, if you do want to capture in 16-bit mode, you don't have a choice. AVI is only 8-bit. Also, in previous versions of Fire Capture, there was a limit of, I think, either 2 or 4 gigabytes for a file size in AVI. That may be... I, there's some box to check in the more recent version for larger recordings. I think you can bypass that. But when I first started doing this, uh, it was limited to file size. And I'll, I'll note file size on the next slide. But this camera produces massive files. So I know I was telling Kevin the other day during our pre-meeting that this camera accumulates data at a rate of 20 gigabytes per 1,000 frames uh, across the full sensor. And it takes around, I mean, it's, it's less than two minutes to acquire. It's actually closer to about a minute to acquire a thousand frames. So you're accumulating 20 gigabytes per, per thousand frames in a very short period of time. And so my typical capture files are over 2000 frames. I usually like to have four to 5,000. So we're talking about 80 to 100 gigabyte files per video. And uh, I don't know if an AVI can even do that. Uh, it definitely could not a few years ago. And so I started capturing an SER. And so that's what I do now out of habit. OK, thanks. So some of this I just talked through. Uh, so it's the same sort of general slide on the left, the considerations. Again, I, if I had to recommend something, I would recommend 75% histogram fill. But again, that needs to be determined experimentally. If you're getting significant clipping or if you're having wild fluctuations due to the seeing, then you might have to back down even more. Uh, shutter speed and gain are, are variable. Don't think that you have to do ultra short exposures. Um, you know, you certainly don't need anything like a millisecond exposure unless you were doing an ISS transit. Uh, that is not doing you any favors. There's some misconceptions out there that you need very fast shutter speeds to freeze the seeing. And it just doesn't work like that. If there's strong turbulence, you can't actually freeze it like an action photo. What you're trying to do with lucky imaging is just capture enough frames that there might be a few lulls in activity of the turbulence. So you're trying to sneak in a few good shots during otherwise average conditions, but you're not freezing the image like an action photogra photograph. Um, so most of the time I'm somewhere around 10 milliseconds in that range. Um, I generally, I almost never go faster than five milliseconds, even with my, my faster scope. And certainly with the F10 SCT, I'm usually at around 10 milliseconds. But sometimes up near 20, if the scene conditions are really good, you know, I, I've seen some phenomenal images out there with people doing 35 millisecond exposures at relatively slow frame rates. So it all works. You know, there's people that, that image on different sides of the spectrum fast and slow uh, with just different gain. And so, it, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you what's right and wrong. Uh, you can certainly experiment with that. But a lot of things work. Uh, as I mentioned before, 8-bit captures are completely sufficient for the moon, which might be somewhat surprising because there is a lot of uh, tonal range in a lunar image. And it really comes down to atmospheric turbulence. When you have enough pixel-to-pixel -pixel variation in intensity on your, uh, your grayscale values from zero to or from, from black to white, even the slightest variation completely destroys the extra bit depth uh, of 12-bit versus 8-bit. And if you do a stack, and I typically like to stack at least 500, sometimes 1,000 frames, um, 
you actually gain regain the precision. So the 8-bit stack, I mean, I've done extensive testing and it just doesn't show really any negative effect compared to the 12-bit stack. The reason you don't want to do a 12-bit stack usually is because it's saved as a 16-bit file, which is twice as large. So on my camera, as I note down here, um, it's producing data at a rate of 20 gigabytes per thousand frames, and that's in 8-bit mode. So if you click that box for 16-bit files, you're going to get 40 gigabytes per thousand frames. And it's almost always better to have more 8-bit files than less um, 16-bit files. So those are just some things to consider. Also, some of what I'm saying is particular or specific to a larger sensor camera. So uh, Kevin mentioned at the beginning, and I should say that Kevin's images are are, are quite excellent. You know, uh, when he said that, uh, you know, uh, or he implied that my, my images were going to have more detail or something like that. His uh, image of the Apollo 15 region, I mean, I, you know, we can't really blow it up on, on Google uh, Meet, but I've looked at the image and there's very fine detail there. So my images are not necessarily unique for the high detail in a small region, but rather the sort of the detail and capturing the entire moon at one time. Uh, so Kevin's images were were quite good, um, but he did allude to the fact that he captured 100,000 frames, and that only works with small sensor cameras. So with this data, <laughs> yes. you know, yeah. So it to some degree, you can overcome the seeing limitations a bit more if you do it that way, if you image a small region. And on the ASI 183, I can use a region of interest. So if I draw a small box, it's approximately the size of the sensor of the ASI 224, then I can also do the same thing at a faster frame rate. Um, typically, I like capturing larger regions, but it does limit me to, I, I almost never capture more than 5,000 frames in a file because that's already 100 gigabytes. And as I'll mention, when we talk about stacking, it takes auto stacker over four hours to stack a file like that. So it turns into a giant pain. But these are some uh, peculiarities that uh, only exist if you're doing this kind of larger format imaging. Hey, Tom, um, can you hang on just a second. We had a question from, I think, sure. Adam Goldberg. Yeah, Tom, uh, this is just a comment to put it in the context, especially for the deep sky photographers. Uh, right. the, moon is, the moon is a reflective object, and it doesn't have the same dynamic range that emissive objects, planetary stars, globulars, uh, even reflection nebulae, those have a much wider intrinsic dynamic range right. uh, of brightnesses than the moon does. So that's one of the reasons your 8-bit will, will very often uh, do the job. Right, right. And I'll talk about this later when I talk about post-processing, but there, um, some people don't realize, and I think it's you know probably in this community, this is all second nature, like everyone will know this, but in the planetary imaging community, not everyone fully appreciates that what we're looking at here um, is a linear file. So, you know, even in this live view here in fire capture, this already doesn't look like the moon when if you just look up at the moon, you know, it's much brighter. There's more Terminator detail and it kind of it gives people the false impression impression that there is a lot of or a ton of dynamic range on the moon. But they don't realize that what they're looking at is uh, this has not been gamma transformed this data. And so there's not as much dynamic range as you might think. And certainly it's not like a deep sky image where the entire interesting part of the image is buried at the very, very far left of the histogram. So you do need to stretch these images and apply gamma, but you don't need to do anything as complicated as the stretching that occurs in a deep sky image, which is certainly why you would, yeah, you, the bit depth is much more important for, for those images. And the image scale. If you're imaging at a lower image scale, you won't have that pixel to pixel variation due to turbulence. But if you're imaging at a scale of 0 0.21 arc seconds per pixel, there's quite a bit of noise built in. Um, but yes, all, all good points. Uh, so just a quick observation on the scene conditions, because the last thing I, I mentioned on, on that uh, previous slide was that the scene conditions are extremely important. So people often ask, you know, if you don't have a frame of reference, it's like, well, if you take an image like this, which I, you know, I, I don't know how this shows up on, on Google Meet, but there's over a dozen craterlets in Plato and the, the Ryle down the, the valley, the Alpine Valley here is, is very obvious. Uh, so the question is, well, what's visible in the raw stack or in an individual 
image because a lot of people are under the assumption that processing is some sort of magic and it brings out detail that that was invisible and that's just not true so it's hard to convey it um in still images but this is a an individual frame so i think it's the frame that auto stacker selected is whatever the it arbitrarily called the best individual frame and so of course it doesn't look as good as it does in live view because when you're seeing it in live view your brain is very good at sort of piecing together and interpolating a moving image and so you can actually see more detail in the flickering real image but at least six craterlets in plato and this uh Alpine Valley, Central Ryle are all visible in the live view. Uh, you can just see it clearly. So this is not the case, even though there's a marked difference between a, the details visible in the processed image, this is all very obvious in the live view. So I, I knew that it was a good scene condition. So there is no magic here. If you can't see the details at all in the live view, then it's really not, they're not gonna pop out in the processed image. And as I mentioned before, it's difficult to convey this because even animations like this don't tend to, to show up nearly as well um, as, as when you're looking at in the live view on the, on the computer. But these are just some representative examples of, of what it sort of looks like, although obviously butchered a bit by uh, being uploaded on the web. Uh, so in this case, the quality graph, we'll talk about auto stacker and I think coming up on the next slide actually, but it gives you a quality graph uh, to estimate your frame quality and it's all relative to the best frame. So it doesn't, when you see a graph like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good seeing, although in this case it was, you can also have uniformly terrible seeing and it'll give a graph like this. So it, it can be a little bit um, confusing sometimes, but this was in fact, Good seeing. So this is just to uh, tell me to, to leave the presentation because I'm going to actually open up um, a window to just show auto stacker here. So just a moment while this opens. Uh, Kevin, Tom, do we want to take a quick five minute bio break for people? Yeah, maybe is that sure. okay, Tom, if we uh, take uh, exactly five minutes? And, yeah, I'll uh, come back in uh, five minutes. Yep, sounds good. Okay, we will all be back in five. Okay.
All right, if uh, everybody's back, if Tom's back in particular, we I am back. go ahead and get started. Okay, sure. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, I'm going to change this window here. So in thinking about this, uh, you know, it, I mean, I, I can't actually stack a file. And in fact, because my videos are 100 gigabytes in size, it's not even very conducive to loading the actual file in here to show this to you. What I opted to do is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, can people see, still see the screen? Yeah, we've still got it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so what I have here is just to simulate how this process would work. I loaded up uh, an image of, this is actually a TIFF file that all right, let's see if it's going to cooperate here. Hold on. <laughs> oh, great. It, <laughs> okay, auto stack it. Okay, we'll hope that this works because it, yeah, it, these files are large. But so this is actually a pre stacked. So this is the TIFF, but it's the same field of view. Uh, so this is um, a video that I'm going to actually show uh, as an example of how to process a, a mosaic ultimately here for a, a moon just past first quarter, which is about the phase that would be ideal to image now. So what you'll normally do is you wouldn't load up an individual image here. This would of course be the video file and it would have thousands of images, but on my camera, they would be this size. So this is representative of, of what you'll have. Um, and so the first thing is when AutoStackard opens, and this is version AS3, Auto Stacker 3. I should say that Emil uh, Craycamp, uh, who develops this, there's an AS4 that is on the horizon to being released, and it's supposed to be much faster. And so that's going to be great because these large files do take quite a long time to process, but uh, the result is fantastic. It's just, it's quite slow. Uh, so the first thing that happens is it's gonna usually load by default. It, it may say planet and that's not what you want. So you need to click on surface stabilization here. Um, and then there's this box that says improve tracking. I just out of habit, click that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly that most of the code for auto stacker does not open source. Um, so we, you know, I don't know exactly how improved tracking works but I just click that and it seems to help. So you'll see this uh, green anchor uh, position here. You can move that around. So on my computer, I think it's control option, click, and it moves. And so you just want to place that over something that has a lot of contrast because what it's going to do first when you click analyze, the reason this analyze button is grayed out is because it recognizes there's only one image here. It's not a video, but normally this would be clickable and you would click analyze and it goes through all of your uh, frames and it does two things. First, it stabilizes them on this anchor point and it's just a global stabilization. So it tries to align the images as well as it can based on, on the point that the region that you select. And then the second thing it does is it uh, computes a quality score and it's based on contrast. So it assumes that the higher contrast is a better quality image than lower contrast. And so then it ranks the frames for you according to that. And then you just have to decide how many to stack. So in terms of these other settings here, I just keep this on quality estimator, Laplace, noise robust six. I don't touch that. Local should be by default. So we'll talk about what this means in just a moment. But uh, if you were to click global, that means it's not going to use alignment points at all in compiling your image. And this is how the old stacking programs used to work. The whole advantage of AutoStacker is using local alignment points. I can talk a bit more about that in a moment, but there's very few scenarios where you would want to click global. You're usually gonna to want to, to click or keep it on local. However, uh, I would not check, so whereas I do check this improved tracking feature up here, do not check check double stack reference. I, I don't know exactly what it does, but it degrades the image. So at first I thought, well, because it sounds like it's doing something twice, maybe there's an improvement or something, um, but that's not the case. It, it actually noticeably makes the image worse. So 
don't don't check double stack reference. Uh, so then what you're going to do is click analyze uh, and it'll compute the, the scores for you. So we're going to skip ahead. Um, so we're not going to do that. Now I'm going to have to make one little adjustment here in order to start adding alignment points. If you look over here, the option to add points is not available in surface mode without clicking analyze. So I'm going to click planet. This is only for demonstration purposes because for some reason auto stacker lets you place alignment points for a planet before you've analyzed the image. So don't do this in your real lunar image, use surface, but I have to do this to um, even allow you to, to see this. So I'll try to, I'm gonna blow this up now. Hey Tom, so, just while you're, yeah. you're paused there, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, Emil Cryocap, the uh, author of uh, Autostacker, did a presentation, uh, I think last fall for Woodland Hills Camera. Uh, and I saw that, yeah. It was, I found it, it's, I think it's almost two hours long, but yeah. it, it, it is super detailed and it finally explains what all those settings mean and, you know, which ones, uh, it helped me understand which ones were relevant to me and which ones weren't and and how to set them um, i put a link to it in the chat for anybody who wants to take a look at it but uh, i'll tell you that you know if if you've looked at auto stacker and thought you know i'm just going to press some buttons here <laughs> um yeah, but but it would be helpful if i knew what they actually did uh go and watch that video he goes through step by step and it's it's a, a great you know, great insight into what the program is doing for you and how to optimize the settings for your particular data. Great, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so basically what I do here is we, we have to decide what size alignment points to add. So a couple of useful tools are if the image is dark, because again, it's a, it's a linear image, you have this option up here for brightness um, and I'm clicking this, and it says right here, does not alter data. So this is just your display. So if you need to have an easier time seeing the image, uh, you, you can adjust that for sure. So I'm just gonna show you a couple. So AP size, so this is alignment point size. And I assume that this is pixels, but if we click just as an example, there's a 200 pixel uh, alignment point box. And just for, you know, we can just layer these kind of, inside each other so you can see the difference in sizes and my recommendation is it, it's all empirical what you're going to need to do is open up your images and find out how much detail is in your image and and the size of the ap boxes that you use depends on your image scale and the image quality so it's important to kind of understand what these are doing and um you know, I, I came across that that interview that uh, Kevin mentioned with ML. Uh, I didn't watch the full two hours, so I, I'm sure he goes uh, into great depth on this. But Autostacker is a lot more sophisticated than a lot of people realize. So let's just say, just for example, you know, say there's I'm just placing some random 200 size boxes here. Um, okay, so it actually computes a score in it for each individual alignment point box independently so even though it, it created an overall ranking that i talked about at the beginning where it looks at contrast and it ranks your frame say you have 5,000 frames and you want to stack the top 500 of them there's a ranking of those frames but that ranking is shown to you initially as a global ranking and in a wide field image of the moon especially parts of the image might be sharper than other parts of the image because the turbulence is actually variable across the field of view. So the way Autostacker works is it recomputes alignment or uh, recomputes quality scores for each individual AP stacks. If you set this to 500, so you can see over here in this, this window on the left, um, I have number of frames to stack. This is up to you. You can also do percentage, but I have 250 and 500. So it's not using the same 500 frames for each alignment point, which is kind of fascinating. And a lot of people uh, didn't know, but if you check the box that says global, 
then it does. So that's what global means. If you check global, it does not use alignment points at all, and it will stack the 500 frames that it considers best. But if you do tests between global and local, you see an amazing difference in the result. And it speaks to the fact that there is extreme variability in the subset of, of different regions of the image. So this is the whole purpose of using the AP alignment points. And as you can imagine, when it takes a different subset of frames for each AP, they won't fit together perfectly if you were to try to manually align them. So it uses pixel warping algorithms to force the blending in a seamless way. So in reality, when you do an image like this, it ends up being kind of a mosaic of the best parts of the original image. Um, so it's just sort of a, an interesting thing that, that not everyone is aware of. But what this means is you just need the alignment points to be small enough so that it can pick up on variation across the frame, but not so small that it's trying to stack on meaningless features. So if you make them too small, two things will happen. One is it can slow down the program so much that it'll crash. And the other thing is that you might actually get nasty artifacts because it's trying to align small regions that don't have any detail. So I'm gonna clear this and just show you, I typically for an image of this scale, use this 104 setting. Not that it means, and you can even adjust, uh, you, you can change by, it doesn't have, you don't have to choose from just these numbers, but just to show you what that looks like, if you were to place alignment points around the rim of Tycho, for example, they look like that. Um, so they're small enough that you're gonna get some variation from frame to frame, but they're not so small that there's gonna be a region that doesn't have detail. So if we come over here, just as an example, even in regions that don't seem to have a lot of detail, there's enough small little features there that it will be able to lock on and align this thing. I've experimented with smaller AP sizes and it can work. Uh, 88 works okay for me here. These numbers are meaningless, by the way, on your scope, because if your image scale is different, uh, it depends on your focal length. So you need to inspect by eye and just say, well, is the alignment point box that I'm using is it big enough to cover several high contrast features uh, and not so small that it's gonna pick up on nothing? So this is the process, but as you can imagine, this dramatically affects the processing time uh, for a larger field of view. So if I zoom out again. Okay, so this is our whole frame. If I hit clear, and I said I like to just as a default start with this 104 size, I'm gonna do place AP grid and we'll just, it'll think for a minute and we'll see what it does. So we have 4,469 alignment points. Uh, and obviously if, if you use even smaller sizes, you're gonna get more. So for an image like this, somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 alignment points is totally standard, but your computer is gonna hate this and it, it really is computationally intensive. So I, that's why I'm looking forward to the auto stacker version four, because apparently the big selling point is that it, it cuts down exponentially on, on this processing time. But this is why it takes me so long to stack these images. Cause ultimately you then go over, you, you place your alignment points, you're gonna select the number of frames to stack and then you're gonna hit stack. I would steer clear of these drizzle options. If you're using a smaller field of view, you can sometimes get away, depending on your computer, with a 1.5x drizzle. Um, if I try this in this image, for example, auto stacker crashes after about an hour of trying. So it's painful in two ways. You come back thinking you're gonna have a finished file and you see that it, it died. So I just steer clear of, of drizzle. I mean, we can talk more about that later, but if you're sampling at the appropriate rate to begin with, with your focal length, then drizzle doesn't have a benefit anyway, even though a lot of people in the planetary imaging community do it because for planetary images, it doesn't take much longer in processing and the extra image scale can smooth out some of the deconvolution a bit. So there's potentially some aesthetic advantages, but on the moon, I would not recommend touching this unless you have a really powerful machine, in which case, give it a try. But auto stacker four, that might be, um, you know, might have that availability. So a couple other 
features. I'm going to clear out these alignment points again. I often use this multi-scale option, if you can see it down here. So this, if you have an alignment point that is too small for AutoStacker to lock onto any features, this will, the default is it uses the global frame uh, to, for stacking. So usually the result is still okay. But if you hit this multi-scale feature, I'm gonna hit place grid. Hopefully this doesn't cause it to crash because it does take a little longer to do it this way. But it's going to first place the uh, alignment points the same way that it did the last time for our 4,469. But now it's gonna add additional alignment points that are a little bit larger. So it, it's a nested layer. They just keep getting bigger and bigger. And it's gonna take a minute here to, uh, to think. And it just turns into a crazy looking, I mean, this looks insane, right? When, when I was first telling people, because when I got this camera, it wasn't necessarily the most recommended. I thought based on my experience that it was gonna be great. And it turns out it's fantastic. So I'm, I made the right call with getting this camera. But there were people that told me that the slow frame rate would be a disadvantage or that it, it would just be, you know, these big files would, wouldn't be, good to process. Um, turns out that that's not true, but it does look insane. Like when you tell people that, okay, there's now almost 7,000 alignment points in this image and it just looks like a, a mess. Amazingly, it, it works out. You know, auto stacker takes sometimes six to eight hours to stack this, depending on how many alignment points you have. Um, but, but it does work out. So let's see the other thing that you may want to play around with. I think I, I think Kevin said he does this as well, but in the advanced option, if you come down to experimental features and parameter tuning, there's this option here in pre-processing of adding a vertical and horizontal blur to the image. This blurs the image by a defined amount. You can change this amount, but it doesn't blur the image for stacking. It only blurs it for alignment. And so this is important because some cameras, including the one I use, including the ASI 183, there's a, an annoying sensor grid pattern, sort of like a fixed pattern noise that is available, uh, is visible sometimes, but not always. It depends on the scene conditions. Ironically, sometimes good seeing makes it worse. But um, in regions of low contrast, such as the Lunar Maria here, you can get an annoying fixed pattern noise where it's actually locked on to some noise and stacked on that auto stacker it has. However, that completely is eliminated if you add a little bit of blur to uh, with these checkboxes. Um, so I'm gonna uncheck those for now, but I, you can play around with that. It does slow down your processing though. So you, it's faster if you don't have those checked, but it's definitely something to consider. The other thing I'll point out before we move on from auto stacker it is again, sort of, the quality of the data. So this, and again, this is not an individual frame because I um, didn't have the videos too large to load for this purpose of this meeting. So this is a stack, but it's unsharpened. Uh, so we're going to move on next to deconvolution, but you can see like, this is pretty good detail. I mean, you know, a number of years ago, people would have been thrilled to have an image like this uh, even after deconvolution. So certainly if you downsize it a little bit. So this sort of, I just highlight this because it, there's this myth out there that somehow processing is magically creating detail. And as Kevin said in the introduction, there's very little sharpening that needs to be done. It's sort of, it's like lifting a haze off of the image, but it, it's not a lot of, of deconvolution that takes place. So before we move on, I guess before, uh, before we leave AutoStacker, if anyone has any questions, now would be a good time because we're going to move on to uh, the post-processing with uh, deconvolution next. I don't see any okay. questions in the chat. All right. We're okay. Okay. So I'm going to close this then. And I'll go through a couple different methods. So um, the first, so I use Astra image. You can use the nice thing about lunar images <clears throat> is that you can do, the sharpening is so modest that you can use <clears throat> so many different programs to do it. You can even use Photoshop directly, which I don't recommend for planets, but uh, the sharpening is usually a little bit more complicated for planets. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to open up. 
I already have, you can see here, saved files decon. So I have some pre-saved files for moving on to the next step, but I'm gonna open up the raw stack here. So this is the same image we just looked at. Um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, sometimes I, just because I'm used to looking at the moon in a normal <laughs> orientation, I, I rotate the images. But again, we, so this is the raw stack. And if I need to, I can, uh, so you can adjust the gamma here in Astro Image, but I actually don't recommend altering this in Astro Image. I only use Astro Image for deconvolution and I do all other post-processing in Photoshop because it has a layer system where you can undo anything that you decide you don't like. Any changes you make here are permanent. And so I don't like, this makes it easier to see sometimes, but I don't like doing this for, um, uh, to save it. So the first thing I do, I almost exclusively just use this for deconvolution. So if you go up to enhance and uh, go to deconvolution, there's a number of options. I use deconvolution for sharpening. And you have a preview window here. You can kind of drag your cursor and it gives you this little preview here. The only thing is your, your gamma ap application in your previous window wasn't applied to this preview. Um, so as you know, I, I don't have any trouble seeing this. I can go apply it permanently if people are having trouble seeing, but can people see the, the detail in this box okay, or is it too dark? Uh, I can see it. It is darker than the other image, but I can see yeah. that there's detail in it, yeah. So we can we can just do this. If I hit apply permanently, so again, please don't, don't do this for your, your real image. I'm just gonna do this for this uh, demonstration here, but I, don't don't apply gamma permanently in, in Astro Image. But I'm gonna go back. So I use, so this is one thing, you, you can just play around. It, you know, I'm not here to tell you what deconvolution method is best. I can just tell you what I've been using. So I use Lucy Richardson and I keep the blur kernel on Gaussian, but you can, you can play around with whatever you want. The nice thing about imaging is, you, I mean, I'm literally still processing images from years ago. You can go back and do whatever you want. Um, so if you, okay, this is just the default settings. If you click do preview, you can see that basically nothing happens, very little, but if you hit this little arrow here, it goes back to your original image. It's almost imperceptible, but just to show you kind of the things to play around with as a first pass, I almost always turn deconvolution strength all the way to the max and keep this on one pixel blur kernel size and just see what happens because you can always undo it. So this, you know, some people, this might suit you. Uh, I think it's a little bit overly contrasted, so it's a little too much, but all it is is just uh, adjusting this to taste. So just to show you what happens if you get out of control here, if you go like 1.5 blur kernel size, you know, now it's just, it's getting, it's ridiculously over sharpened. If you go to two, you know, pretty quickly, ultimately, you blow an image up and it doesn't even look like the moon anymore, right? If we go to four, it just looks like that. So in this case, I start with one just to see what it looks like, but the, the preferred parameter is gonna depend on your image scale and the quality of the data. So on this, I think it was something around 0.7 that I ended up liking, but it it's sort of, it's just trial and error. You can also adjust the strength, although I usually tend to keep the strength on maximum and just make the blur kernel size smaller but this will depend on your data. I can only speak to what has been working with my data. If you have really good seeing, which this was pretty good, this blur kernel size will be small because it's essentially defining a point spread function for the deconvolution. And even though there aren't point sources of light here, it's an extended object, the principle is the same. So the less turbulence you have, the smaller this point spread function will be. If you have poor seeing, you may well have to go up to say like a 1.2 um, and that might look great. And for this image, it's overly contrasted and overly sharpened, but that's because this was good seeing. So these are the sorts of things where every image you have to play around with and just find something that you like. Um, so I'm gonna hit cancel because the deconvolution, it, it takes, you know, I don't want the program to hang here. I have pre-adjusted images that, uh, that I already did to move on to the next step. But I'm going to just briefly open Registax to show you another way to do this, unless anyone has uh, questions here on Astro Image while we're still in the program. 
Okay. So Registax is uh, free. The Astra image was, I think, $45. It, and I've had it for years, and it was worth the, the cost. But <clears throat> Registax is free, and many people are familiar with it from uh, planetary imaging because it's uh, very useful for wavelet, <clears throat> excuse me, wavelet sharpening. So I'm just going to open that same image that we just looked at. The reason I started using Astra image, I, I currently like the results better, although to be honest, it's such a subtle difference that I, I really can't say that it's that much better than, than Registax using wavelets. The primary re reason is, and we'll see if Registax cooperates here, Registax doesn't like my large files so much. So if this hangs, I'm just going to move on because I don't want to waste people's time. But Astra Image seems to work much better with um, with the larger files. So it's still giving me this circular wheel of death here. So let me just, I'll give it a few more seconds to see if it stabilizes. Okay. Um, you know, okay. So again, the only processing that you'd ever really need for an image like this is super simple. So I go to wavelet. Um, I don't use linked wavelets. People will uh, check this box for planetary imaging sometimes. And I, I should say that in planetary imaging, you get very convoluted series of adjustments and they work amazingly. They work. I, I use it myself, but on the moon, anything super complicated like that in the image just blows up into nonsense. Uh, you really only need very simple adjustments. So I tend to keep this set on linear here and Gaussian. And the first thing I do just to test is to take this first slider and slide it all the way to the right. And I'll have to see where, okay, it sets a little preview box. So we're, and I'm not going to move this preview box because it, it causes the program to slow down. Um, but this is sort of the same region around Tycho. And you can see there's a dramatic sharpening of the image. And by sliding, if that's a little bit too much for you, you can just back down. And so much like an Astra image where we were playing around with the point spread function, you just have to find something that you like. And so unfortunately, there is no good mathematical way to calculate this. It's In scientific imaging, you can usually get you have calibrated images and there's ways to measure a point spread function that you would want to use based on parameters of the image. But because we're imaging through an atmosphere here and there's not even a point source in the image, um, it just doesn't work out to try to mathematically calculate what the best deconvolution or wavelet is. You just have to look at the image and decide if it's something you like. And I should say that there's some personal variation, you know, opinion. Some people tend to like images that are more on the over sharpened side others like a softer you know sort of more natural view i, I should say that even the word you, you run into trouble even just trying to describe an image as natural or not though because how do we define natural you know if natural means looking through the eyepiece then yes there's going to be some significant blurring if natural means what a lunar orbiter image would look like then you know there's not a lot of softness to a lunar image so it, it's really just you have to look at this and decide if it's something you like so i'm going to exit registax now um, there's other things you can do in registax you can change the histogram you know for example you, you could well i may not tempt fate here you you can brighten the image i i do all of this in in photoshop so I'm going to exit this now unless anyone has any uh, questions on Registex. Okay. Hey, Tom, I just wanted to throw in for the folks yeah. that do uh, uh, deep sky imaging. Um, I, uh, I I don't have Aster image, but um, I, I sort of went back and forth when I was doing my Mars images and then those lunar images that I, that I did uh, over the last few months. Um, and what I, I, I found that uh, the deconvolution algorithms in Pixel site can pretty much replicate uh, the sharpening that you're doing in uh, Registax. Uh, yeah. After messing back and forth for a long time, I, I finally decided that uh, I just felt I was, I was more comfortable with the control that I got in Registax. Uh, but I, I think in terms of like what you can get, uh, deconvolution in Pixon site, uh, once you've worked it through enough, will probably give you pretty much the same results as what you would get in Registax. So feel free to do it either way from my, from my yes. opinion. 
so I, I should say, and I, I told Kevin this uh, the other day. So w back over the summer, I was taking some images of uh, Comet Neowise. Uh, you know, I, I don't, for reasons that due to time and, and equipment, um, I, I don't really do deep sky imaging, but I did drive out. I'm about an hour away from the desert here where there's Bortle three skies. So it is actually quite good. And I did some common imaging and was trying to process it using deep sky stacker. And it, you know, it was kind of annoying and Photoshop was a nightmare for this, even though I love Photoshop for the moon. Uh, so I did do the uh, free trial of PixInsight and it was a fantastic program. The only reason I haven't purchased it is I have not done any deep sky imaging since then. And so I, I just have had no reason to, to purchase it. But when I did have the free trial version, uh, I did some lunar processing. Uh, and the, in particular, the multi-scale linear transform is fantastic and does exactly this, like what you're seeing here in Registax and also what we saw with the Lucy Richardson deconvolution and Astra image, the multi-scale linear transform I really liked. For some reason, I didn't like the, the actual deconvolution. There is a Lucy Richardson decon that you can do in PixInsight and there's some, there's restoration filters that they didn't seem to do as well on the moon, but the multi-scale linear transform was really fantastic and produced the fantastic results. So if I if I had picks in sight, you know, if, if I bought, if I buy it in the future, if I get into deep sky imaging and use it on the moon, um, I, I would do use that. I should say that the for compiling mosaics, there's so many annoying things about a mosaic that it does suit Photoshop a lot with the layers. PixInsight is excellent if you just have a single panel and you really want, I like the histogram transformation tool. There, you can process a lunar image after the stacking phase entirely in PixInsight, but ultimately it does, uh, if you're gonna be doing mosaics, it, it may not be the best the program to do that since there's a lot of things that uh, work well with the, the layer system. Okay, so let's see here. I think I'm, Okay, when we talk about mosaics, I think uh, there's something I'll come back to this window for, but I'm going to go back into uh, the presentation now. So we've sort of uh, covered the basis of stacking and deconvolution. And so now uh, we're going to go into post-processing, which whether this is difficult or easy really depends on your field of view and whether or not you're doing a mosaic. So in some cases, it could be super simple and super easy. And in other cases, it could be uh, much more complicated. So the first thing, and this again, probably is not news at all to the, the audience here, but a lot of people in the planetary imaging community aren't really aware of the, uh, or not necessarily aware of the, the concept of, of gamma in images and how the images we're looking at are linear. Uh, and so in, in a deep sky image, it's obvious because your image just looks black when you open it. Uh, it just you can't see it, which is why PixInsight has the auto stretch feature for your display. But a lunar image, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't have that much dynamic range. So it almost looks like the moon when you open it. So a lot of people don't realize that it's a linear image and they just start processing it in sRGB color space. And the end result looks a little weird and they, they don't really know why. But essentially, your monitor is expecting an image to be gamma encoded. So if, if we have input along the x-axis and output along the, the y-axis, a one-to-one -one slope is just linear. And we see the world without gamma correction. So you know your eyes have a nonlinear response, but we just see the light the way it is. And you want that to be recreated on the monitor. But the problem is the monitor, going all the way back from CRT days, uh, it's expecting an image that was reciprocally gamma encoded so that these the input gamma and the output gamma cancel out and achieve this linear image again. And there's a variety of technical reasons for that. I don't really want to get into it, but back in the days of CRT, it was encoded into the electron gun. It was just a, a feature the gamma naturally happened due to energy losses. But it was also noted that it served a useful purpose because you can compress di uh, bit depth. Uh, so essentially, if you have a grayscale scene sort of shown here going from black to white, just to make it dramatic, this website here only used five bits to encode the data. If you linearly encode the data, you can see that there's very large gradations in the coming off the black level and then very fine gradations here near white 
that you really can't even, your eye doesn't even appreciate this. So it's not really a sensible way to code the data. If you gamma encode the data, it breaks it up into a much more seamless uh, transition. Ultimately, the you encode the data, the monitor decodes it, and you get back out what you put in, but there's a number of reasons why this is done. And so I bring this to people's attention because if you shoot with a DSLR and you use just standard photo processing software, this is all done for you, even if you think that you process the raw image. So as many of you, uh, you know, I, I do shoot landscapes and, and other things and will often process the raw file in, in the case of my Nikon, it's an NEF file. And I use Adobe Camera Raw, the raw editor in Photoshop. And it pulls up a version that looks almost like the JPEG. It's just not sharpened and it doesn't have quite the, the contrast, but it's very similar. And so some people think that's the raw file, but actually if you use other uh, programs, Pick and Sight will let you do this. Raw Therapy is a free program that will let you do this. You can find the true raw file. And if you open it in linear color space, you see what is in the uh, box number one up here it's almost imperceptible, the image. And so your camera, either in camera or in Adobe Camera Raw, it takes this linear file. In the case of a color file, it has to debayer it, white balance it, um, a number of other things, but it applies a gamma transformation as well as a tone curve that's similar to this film-like curve drawn here where it brings out the highlights and adds a little bit of uh, pop to the, the shadows here. And ultimately, th this is an actual example I took with my DSLR where this box four is what the JPEG looks like. So if you take an image and look at the back of the camera, that's your preview and you say, okay, the exposure looks pretty good, but you don't, the true raw file that you never saw uh, is, is here and it, it's very, very dark. And so just as kind of a more extreme example of that, I, I took an image of the moon where I maxed out the expression. I, I went, I, or exposure, I exposed as, high as I could before the little uh, overexpression indicators started flashing on the back of the DSLR. And if you open the JPEG, you can see that, yeah, there's even some clipping down here and it's super bright. And uh, most people would say, okay, I overexposed a little. If you actually pull this raw linear file, this is what it looks like. And from the linear histogram, you can see that there's no clipping whatsoever. Um, and it actually looks comparable to what we get with an astronomy camera. Uh, so there is a discrepancy between what you get with the astro cameras and what you get if you're shooting the moon with uh, just looking at the histogram on the back of the camera or even in a raw editor like Adobe Camera Raw. So I mention it because when we, you know, I'm, I'm usually using this ASI 183. And so this is an example of the entire moon fit into one frame taken with my, my smaller scope. And so if you open the processed image, so this has been stacked and sharpened, and if we open it in Photoshop, it usually the default setting is to assign it to your working profile, which is usually a, uh, either sRGB or Adobe RGB, but they're both, those are two very similar uh, profiles. So in this case, it, it assigned it, this is a grayscale image, it assigned it to gray uh, gamma 2.2, but that's very similar to a, a grayscale version of sRGB. And so it looks dark, of course. Now I'll show you a way to, you can set a custom color profile that tells Photoshop that the can, uh, this is not a gamma encoded image. This is a gamma one linear image. If you do that, it displays it like this. And this is much more like what you would have seen on the back of your DSLR. Uh, and it looks more like what the moon looks like if you just look up by eye. You know, we, we can look at the moon and we know that it, it doesn't look like that. It looks a little bit more like that. So the histogram didn't change at all. You can see this is still a linear histogram, but it opened it telling it uh, that this is a linear file. So in some ways, I suppose it's a little bit like the auto stretch feature in, um, in PixInsight, although I don't know the particulars of how uh, that one works. If, if we take this image and then we convert back to sRGB, the image stays, it looks just the same, but the histogram shifts. And so that's also a cause of some confusion. When you convert a color profile, you're keeping the image appearance the same, but you're changing the actual values of the histogram into a different color space. So again, if we go back to linear space, this is what the, the raw linear histogram looked like, but then had this been taken on a DSLR, that's what your histogram would look like. So it's been transformed into sRGB color space. And so I usually do all of my 
early step processing on the linear file, but then I move it into sRGB color space using this method before I do the final edits because sRGB is what people see on the web. And so I like to be editing the final edits in the same color space that, that people are gonna see, if that makes sense. You, you can never control what someone's monitor is gonna show, but you can at least try to ballpark it by being in the right color space. Okay, so I'm just gonna back out of this now and show a few examples of how this uh, works out in Photoshop. Okay, so here's an, if I try to open this image, it's gonna ask me. So I'll just show you an example. It says this document is missing or it does not have an embedded grayscale profile. What do you wanna do? So the default is to assign it to generic gray gamma 2.2. So if I do that, it looks like this. And so, uh, let's see. All right, are people seeing the full screen Photoshop now? I yeah, I'm so. seeing it. Okay. okay. So this image, you know, depending on your monitor, I mean, to me, it looks very dark, you know, like the raw linear file. So you have a couple options. I'll show you how you can change this here, and then I'll show you how to do it with a, another color profile as well. Um, so one simple way is if you just add a a levels curve or a, a levels adjustment layer. You have, of course, blacks here and, and whites here. Um, this middle number is gamma and that's your gamma multiplier. So one just means it's multiplying by one, which doesn't do anything. If you do 2.2 uh, in sRGB, you know, a standard monitor is uh, expecting a 2.2 approximate uh, gamma curve. So it's an exponential curve. So if you do that, that alone already you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's like a perfect, you know, it's not the finished product, but that already gets your Terminator detail back. Um, and if you spot check the histogram, oh, let me pull up our, oh, my histogram window. Let's see, where is it? It might be hiding. Huh. Just, <laughs> I'm not sure if the screen share, I'm not sure what happened to my histogram window. Oh, it's down here. Okay, funny. All right, it was hiding in my other screen. Okay, so you know you can move this little box around and, and look at the histogram on, on any point. Um, and so ideally, you don't want any true black. So even here, you can see the mean is is ten. So that's that's good. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't like any black clipping in my my raw capture. So if if we undo and here, this is why I like Photoshop. You can just toggle things on and off and change. So if we take this away. Um, you know, now you're, you're black level here, you're at two, so you're not clipped, but you just can't see it. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly what you see on your monitor, but this, you know, if you look at the moon, it just doesn't look like that. It looks a little bit more something like that. So that's one method that you can do um, to correct this. The other thing then, and I'll just do a few examples of this where I go through just general processing schemes. So the first thing I'm gonna do actually, I'm gonna delete this. Um, and because this opened in gray gamma 2.2, I'm just going to go ahead and convert this just because I don't want there to be any surprises later. If you get a bunch of layers together in a final composite and you realize you're in a different color space, sometimes the adjustments you've made act differently when you've changed color spaces. So again, this is why I always have to search for it. So convert to profile. So it's going to pull up this window here. So I'm in this color space, generic gray gamma 2.2, and I wanna change it to sRGB. So I'm gonna do that, and the image won't change in appearance at all, but it's moved it into uh, sRGB color space. So now I'm just gonna do the same thing. And I'll just show you a few easy adjustments. Again, this is something you're gonna to have to play around with on your own, and I can't tell you what results you'll like the best, but the, I, I first add some gamma, and then I usually come in and do like that film style curve that I was telling you about. And this is just purely to taste. You can, you can do whatever you want here. Um, you can either do a two point curve or you can even add a, a third point if you want additional ways to, to adjust this here. And if you decide that something is 
too bright for you and easy. There's just so many variations of what you could do in Photoshop. So you could go back to the gamma adjustment layer and just reduce this. I mean, obviously <laughs> you can do rather extreme adjustments, but you just play with whatever gamma you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be 2.2. Your curve here, in addition to moving these individual curves. Now, the only reason I did this in the first place and actually, like in this case, I think it's making the Terminator too dark, but this isn't meant to sort of uh, settle on any best results uh, just here, but th these are just some things that you should think about. If you don't have an additional curve, this is fine, although there's no highlight. Uh, if you look at, I mean, you can either look by eye, but you just look at the histogram too. Um, we'll put it over here. If you click the exclamation mark, it gives you a more complete histogram. So this thing is still, you know, no one says it has to be centered. Uh, it, it's sort of context dependent. Whether or not you want it centered in the middle or more on the darker side is up to you. But there's there's clearly not a lot of, of highlight detail. And so you can add some of that back just through doing manipulation with curves. And it's just up to you to define uh, what you want. So something like this, you know, is certainly centered towards the middle and then as i mentioned you can adjust this gamma to different amounts so you just have to find what you want and i should say that the final decisions depend on the field of view that you're going to be showing so something that might look good globally across this entire frame might not be what you want if you are going to focus only on this region so if we zoom in you know only on this region this is arguably pretty realistic because this region is, I mean, that's 121, we're near the midpoint, this is middle gray. If you were in lunar orbit, this would probably look similar to this, but for aesthetic purposes, you may, you know, you may want to add more contrast to it and have it look like this. Um, and you can look at NASA images and they do the same thing. It all just, it, dep uh, it depends on what they're trying to show in the image. If you make it super dark, it might look interesting in this region, but then that doesn't make a lot of sense if you globally apply it across the moon. Because again, say you're trying to show someone detail around Copernicus here, it's so dark that you can't see much. So in this case, you might wish that you were back up at, at gamma 2.2 so that you can see more of this detail. So these are just some of the things that I think about. And so you have to try to balance uh, you know, what you wanna show people in an image. So that's kind of what I'll say about uh, processing an individual panel, and then we can um, move on to mosaics. I guess the other, I will point out though, if you did want to open this in a different color profile. So let me just show you something here. All right, if you go to the color settings menu in Photoshop, okay. So I'm in custom, RGB. If you wanted to set a new custom RGB or make a new file, you come in here and you just type in whatever gamma you want. So you can see I have gamma one, but let's say the normal default setting in Photoshop is Adobe or uh, sRGB usually. So if you do that, and then you load custom, it just gives you, this is the settings that sRGB uses. So you can see the gamma is 2.2. So this sort of highlights the problem of why when you open a linear file in, if you assign it to sRGB color space, it's expecting a gamma 2.2. If you didn't give it that, then it's gonna make the, the image very dark because it doesn't know that it didn't have it. So just as an illustration of how this works, I'm gonna close this file and I'm gonna open it again. So the same file, but it's gonna ask me what I want to open it at. And last time I said, yes, let's assign it to generic gray gamma 2.2. But this time I'm going to assign it to this gray gamma one profile that I've created before. And that's how it opens it. So if you look at the raw histogram, sorry, right here, it's the same histogram as it was before. So nothing changed, but it's showing us the image differently. And that's because we told it that it didn't have any gamma applied. So now if we convert this image, to sRGB, it stays the same again, but look at the, the histogram. So I can do the, the Apple Z to undo this. And so if we go back and forth, you can see that nothing changes in how the image appears, 
but the histogram is going back and forth. It's being converted from a linear histogram into sRGB. So this is actually what I do most of the time because it's just so easy. I just open it this way and then convert it to sRGB. And then I don't have to apply any gamma. So then my only processing steps usually are open up a curves adjustment layer, you know, do some type of little film curve, whatever you want, um, you know, depending on what you're wanting to show. And then I will usually make an adjustment layer with the black level. If you hold down alt and slide, it'll it's a black clipping indicator. And I don't like much black clipping. So you can start to see, because you'll lose data. So even just right there, you I don't know what's showing up on the meeting, but you can kind of see that we were just starting to encroach on the Terminator. So if you toggle this on and off, you can see that it, it just reduced the, or brought the black level up a little bit so that the background is closer to true black, but you haven't lost a lot of data here. A lot of people, uh, you can run into trouble if you start moving this black light level up, you, that's clipping. So that's just lost, that's lost data. So I occasionally I see images of the moon that look like this. And you know while this certainly has a lot of contrast, and if you zoom in, for example, uh, so this is the, uh, region around Apollo 15, so Rima Hadley, this looks pretty good. I mean, you know, high contrast, the shadows look nice, but this is not how I would want to present this image because this data, there, there's supposed to be a, a terminator here and you're supposed to be able to see it. And so I, I, I recommend being careful with, with that black clipping. Uh, so that's kind of, this is just the, the process that I do for, um, for individual panels. So the, the next thing I wanted to go over was just a, a mosaic. And then, you know, depending on time, we may, <laughs> we may have to save some of this for, for another time. So, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of details of what one could do here. But before I go on to mosaic, uh, if anyone has any just general questions on uh, this type of processing. Hey, Tom, uh, this is Kevin. I just wanted to ask one uh, specific question that I think it probably would apply to a lot of us. Uh, who image with color cameras, uh, like I use the ASI 224, and I think a lot of people uh, use that camera for because uh, they right. use the planetary imaging. So when I get uh, a color image out of AutoStacker, do you, uh, I mean, I know your camera is black and white, but if you were using a color camera, do you just go ahead and take the whole, uh, uh, all three color layers uh, over into Photoshop? Do you try and extract one of the color layers? No, or what? Yeah, I, I don't. So I've actually used um, the ASI-224. I, well, I have the ASI-224. I use it all the time for planets. And before I got the ASI-183, I used the 224 on the moon. And it's a fantastic camera. Uh, my problem with it wasn't even that it's a color camera. It's that the, the sensor is so small. I would recommend... So letting AutoStacker, of course, debayer the raw frames. And so AutoStacker uses a drizzle algorithm to debayer. So because you have thousands of frames available, it kind of bypasses the problems of interpolation that normally come up with uh, debayering. You kind of don't have to guess what the colors were because there's enough image shift from movement across the sensor that it samples through the thousands of frames. It knows what the true color was for each uh, uh, part of the, the bear matrix. So it does a very nice job debayering and then it saves a file that is a generic no color profile. So an unsigned RGB document. So what happens is, I don't know if I have an example here of an image cause it's been so long since I've used that camera, but when you try to open a file, like if I, if I just close this again, just so I can pull up that, that window again, when you try to open this file, and if it doesn't have a color profile, it gives you this. It says it does not have an embedded grayscale profile. So in the case of your file from an ASI-224, it's going to say it doesn't have an embedded color profile. What would you like to do? And the default profile will usually be assigned to, instead of gray gamma 2.2, it will be sRGB most often. But you can assign a custom gamma 1 color profile in RGB. So this one's in grayscale. Um, in fact, I wonder if, I, yeah, so AutoStacker even saves, the only reason these are grayscale files to begin with is that Astra image, I, I choose grayscale as my output in Astra image, but the actual raw image coming out of, um, AutoStacker 
is a color image even for grayscale. It's saved in RGB. So let me just show you. Um, I think I can find an example. It'll be the same image. So yeah, the de the images that I apply deconvolution to are grayscale, but these are the actual un uh, unsharpened versions, and this is RGB. So look, if I click open. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it does not have an embedded RGB profile. What do you want to do? So you either open an sRGB or I'm going to assign it to this custom. And so this image, it you know, it's rotated. But so this is unsharpened. Uh, it's the same as it was before, but it has so color information. Now, in your case, you would have slight variations in the color channels. So I'll talk about that just in, in a quick second. But I would first then convert to sRGB because you're in this custom, in my case, a, a gamma one color profile. I'm going to convert to sRGB. And so again, now that histogram looks like this, uh, in the case of your, so I've experimented with e extracting layers uh, for the different colors. Usually for whatever reason, the actual color composite has the best resolution and you can't do much better than it. There is the option of uh, over in this, I mean, you could use, you could even use programs um, like PixInsight to extract individual channels. I'm sure you could do it in, in Photoshop. There's also, if you wanted to convert your color image to black and white, um, this option here, which of course does nothing on my image that's already black and white, but you then have the option to uh, tell the program how you wanna do the conversion. So converting a color image to a grayscale image is not as simple as a lot of people think. You have to decide how are you going to assign the grayscale tones from coming from each color? And Photoshop has different methods. You can use a red filter, green filter. Um, so you can play around with either extracting the channels individually or telling Photoshop or another program how to do your conversion to grayscale if you wanted a grayscale image. Uh, I've seen nothing to that leads me to recommend extracting the color channels. I would just keep it as a color image. Yeah, and then that was, there's that a, was, yeah. That was my experience with the, the, I tried to extract the red channel. I tried to extract, extract the green channel. Uh, but in the end I found just uh, uh, converting the, uh, the, the, the color image to grayscale and going with that uh, gave me at least as good results as trying to extract any of the channels. Yes. And I think it, you know, I, I don't know the, the, best explanation of why that's the case, but somehow the the final image of just putting it together with, after debayering with the RGB, since it was intended to be a color image, it all seems to work pretty well when you keep it as a color image. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk just briefly about mosaics. Okay, so here's an example of a, a different example of the moon. This isn't the example I'll, I'll work through, but this is one I was working on recently. And so the advantage of uh, the ASI-183 is I, I can do an image like this in only four panels. Now this was cutting it pretty close. I would actually recommend if you want to avoid headaches, and I did actually have a few backup panels I didn't need to use, but you probably want a little more overlap than this just to make it easier on yourself. But the advantage of the uh, the camera is that this is the field of view. Each, each of these white boxes is the, the field of view on my C925 uh, with that camera. So you, you get quite a lot of coverage with uh, good detail. So I have done a, a number of different ways to do mosaics. On a simple level, You with just a few panels, you can manually align and then you could use layer masks and hand draw the, the blending. However, it's kind of, a huge pain to do it that way. And it's easy to make mistakes uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is it gets back to what I was mentioning earlier with auto stacker, the individual alignment points are evaluated independently. And then the final image is spliced together. So what this means is there's tiny variations that you would never notice looking at an individual panel. But yet when you put two panels over each other, they're not completely superimposable. And this becomes very apparent when you're dealing with large fields of view. For example, in this overlapping region here, you might get perfect overlap between these two panels over here and then find that it's impossible to get perfect overlap on this side. And it's nothing that can be corrected by rotation. It's just a slight difference in almost like a perspective change 
but it comes down to the fact that they were just different images uh, with a, a slightly different collection of, of alignment points that were spliced back together. Um, same thing happens down here. If, if you align overlapping panels manually perfectly on the limb, then you will come up here and you can toggle between the panels and you'll see a discrepancy. And it's super annoying. When I first uh, started doing mosaics, I thought it would be easy to align by hand and was sort of shocked that it wasn't. It turns out that the programs that do it for you don't achieve perfect alignment either, but they force, they essentially hide it during the blending stage. And the best way to illustrate this is to look at if you have Photoshop auto blend your layers, it produces layer masks for you that look something like this. And the notable feature here is this is nothing I would ever could hand draw. Uh, and it avoids features with a lot of contrast. And so what it means is when it forces the alignment, even though there's scientific inaccuracy, if you went in and measured this in a map projection, you'd find some error because there was not perfect overlap, but it's nothing that people would be able to detect in the image. So when you look at this animation of toggling a layer mask on and off, you can see that where the two panels interface, there is a shift. You know, you could measure this. It's only on the order of a few pixels, but nevertheless, there's a shift. But it's conveniently avoided occurring in regions such as the crater rims that would be obvious. So uh, you're going to have to play around with a variety of different uh, mosaic softwares. Some work better than others. And for whatever reason, some mosaics are just a pain. And sometimes the automatic software just doesn't want to work. And this is why it takes me, in some cases, weeks, if not months, uh, to do a mosaic. Not because I'm spending all that time working on it, but you get you get tired of it and you just have to put it away for a while and then come back later and maybe try a, a slightly different method. So I'll show you a very basic method to get this to work, but keep in mind, when you try this on your own, you may or may not have, it, it may work very easily, or you may find some some problems that you run into. So it's just sort of a, a trial and error uh, based thing. But I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways to do it, and then that'll probably be a good ending point depending on uh, people's uh, patience. So, uh, but thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so a program that a lot of people don't know of, but so you can do, Photoshop has a photo merge feature. I can already tell you that it, it uh, doesn't always work as well as you would like. Um, so I'm gonna show you a, a different method that is actually free. So if I can find the icon, okay, it's called Microsoft Ice. And I came across some uh, talk on the web about how this might have been taken down. I, I don't know if they're still supporting the program, but you can you should be able to find and download this for free. Uh, if you Google search for Microsoft Ice, you can even find some descriptions of this in uh, articles talking about panorama software intended for uh, landscape photography. And it's kind of referred to as a hidden gem. You know, not many people know about this program. It's free. It doesn't have any frills, but it just seems to work pretty well. So if you click panorama from images, I already have some pre-selected uh, images here taken from a, a moon near first quarter. So I'm just gonna open those. Okay, and now I'm just gonna let it auto detect and just, it, it tends to just work. And so it's gonna think for a minute. Okay, so it put them together. Uh, I normally, I don't crop at all. Um, I don't know, it, you can crop it if you want. And I'm gonna show you a couple pitfalls though with ice. So you can see this this version here isn't blended, but it, it looks at least on the surface like it aligned the panels pretty well. Uh, so now you go to export. And now here's here's a critical thing. I had stopped using Microsoft Ice for years because of what I'm about to show you, but there is a way around it. So if you just save this as a TIFF image, this particular example isn't very good because it does a poor job with the blending, but it does highlight a particularly common problem. So I would not actually just export the TIFF. I would export as Adobe Photoshop and select all layers. Don't select composite only. 
So you'll do this and you'll export to di uh, disk. So now I'm going to exit this program because I already did that. And I'm just going to open the result in, in Photoshop. And I'll show you what um, some potential problems are. So we're OK. So first of all, so here's our here's our file. And they're massive, uh, these. So hopefully Photoshop doesn't freeze here. It had to save it as a PSB file because it's large. So first of all, I'm. Uh, well, okay, I'm going to assign it to custom RGB, like I said before. Okay, so you can see this file down here, it's 1.69 gigabytes, this Photoshop file, and the image size, let's see. So it's 6,727 pixels by 10,063 pixels. Um, so a couple things, it, it has the individual la layers. Let me just take the composite off. So you can see where each individual layer comes in and we can inspect that. But what I wanna draw your attention to is why it's good to save the layers is if I move this composite up to the top and turn it on, look what it did here. It really struggled with this, this image. And there's a number of ways around this, but um, it just did a terrible job, right? I mean, that that's not blended at all. There's uh, artifacts. All over the place so we can do better than that uh, so we're actually going to get rid of that image because that's worthless and now we have have this uh, just to illustrate sort of the alignment situation if we come down here and toggle one of these on and off you can see there's a slight amount of pixel shift but that's actually pretty good Yeah, that's actually pretty good too. So overall, you you, you know, I'm, I don't want to waste people's time, but you can inspect these images and you can find like, there's an example of how the edge of this frame is a little blurred too. Um, one of the frames is a little sharper than the other. I found though, this is where Photoshop is really smart with the blending. It Those minor discrepancies get completely eliminated during the blending. But I did want to alert you to one thing because there was a, uh, this was actually, I was recently playing around with this and it's kind of surprising. So the first thing is you can see the difference in exposure between the panels. And so the reason this happens is I exposed each panel to the same histogram fill. When I mentioned I was talking about exposure, I go to about 75%. And this means that actually the Terminator panels appear brighter than the other panels because these panels are driven, these super bright points, this Stevanus and Fernarius craters and Proclus are so bright that they dominate the histogram. So the rest of this is a little bit drab compared to the Terminator panels that actually require a longer exposure. So it, it, it sort of creates this imbalance. Now you might think, well, what if you just used the same exposure setting across every panel? Then it would actually be easier to blend, but you would sort of needlessly be giving away detail along the Terminator because you'd be underexposed. So I prefer to do all this in post-processing. It's very easy to, reduce the exposure of these panels in post-processing while still retaining all that data because this is now a 16-bit file that's been stacked so part of the problem is if you don't do anything if you just highlight these layers and now go up to edit and auto blend it gives you this menu here let me pull this up okay for some reason, the default, it says stack images. You don't want that. We're making a panorama and you want seamless tones and colors. So I can tell you that if it does what it was doing in my test run, this is not going to work. But let's just see what it what it does here. So it thinks for just a minute. Hopefully a quick minute. I guess if anyone has questions as we go along, hopefully Photoshop's not failing us here, but uh, certainly feel free to work in quite, okay. Uh, and so this is a terrible result, right? There's, uh, I mean, obviously it completely missed this. Uh, there, it's just overall horrible. So what happened? Well, I'm gonna undo that. Okay. In a normal panorama, it's not expecting to have these sharp gradations in exposure between panels. So what I found works here is just go in and neutralize the, the exposures. 
So I already did this. So I know that approximately reducing this panel uh, by about 0 0.8 stops uh, of exposure will do it. So I'm gonna, I do an exposure adjustment layer and then I merge down and that's gonna take care of one panel. And then we're gonna do the same thing to the other panel. So I'm gonna do minus 0.8 and now I'm gonna go up to layer and I'm gonna go merge down. So it's always good to save as you go along because anytime you merge something, it's a permanent, but you can see that already that looks almost blended just based on the exposure itself, but we didn't lose any detail on the Terminator. So now if I go in, highlight them and go to edit auto blend layers, again, check panorama, check seamless tones and colors, click okay. It's gonna think for a minute. So it has its little indicator there. So it doesn't take too long, but the larger your panorama and the more panels you have, the more it will have to think. Okay. And so uh, obviously that looks a lot better. So if you zoom out far enough, it shows you these fracture lines, but that's just to tell you where the layer masks are. So you can look at the individual layer masks that it used for each panels. But if you zoom in, we can make this full screen. You can see that overall, this looks like it, it did a nice job. And it's always good to go down and inspect the limb, you know, make sure there's nothing weird happening. You know, you'll get little artifacts like this in the black layer, but that, or the background, but that doesn't matter because usually the final step is to bring this black, uh, the background down to black anyway. Um, so overall, I like that result. One cautionary tale that I'll tell you is that for some reason, if you do this method that I just showed of bringing down the exposure and then trying to blend them, if you do this on the linear files, but having opened them in sRGB color space and applied the gamma, it doesn't work. Photoshop hates it and the blend looks terrible. So this is still in that custom linear color space that I was telling you about. So again, I would save, which I'm not gonna do, but then I'm gonna flatten this image because I decided I like it. So it flattens all the layers. And then I'm going to convert this to sRGB. And so now we're in sRGB. And so if you look at the histogram, that's our histogram. So you can see there's no, no black clipping. We're already close to centered. Um, overall, the image doesn't look that bad. And again, just you sort of flavor it up to personal taste. So, you know, I tend to like a little bit of uh, highlights, you know, maybe something, I don't know, maybe something like that. And then you can certainly adjust the black level a little bit. And so you get something like this. And so this is almost a finished product. And then the only thing you would do is uh, there's some difference in the background because the glow, basically the, you know, through the atmosphere and the optics coming off the illuminated limb makes the background brighter here than here and definitely do not simply just reduce the black level here to zero because you'll destroy the terminator detail so if you do alt and look for your clipping indicator you can see how you're already starting to clip the terminator if you were to bring this down to the limb now your moon looks like that and while maybe at a really small image scale it looks fine when you blow it up and i see images like this all the time uh here on the terminator this should have detail and it doesn't and you can see where it, it went it, it was lost to, to black clipping so you just kind of have to decide how you want to approach that what i usually do is uh i bring the black clipping level until we're just starting to get maybe just clip right at the edge of the terminator and then if you really want this to be true black you, you essentially just subtract your background. There's a number of ways. It, it can become tedious, so I don't want to really get into it. But one simple way in Photoshop, if you want to cut the moon out essentially and put it on an artificial black background, you can create a levels layer to just blow this out as white and then use your magic wand selection tool. And you can select the moon. And if we disable that layer, you can see what it did here. It essentially if you see the dotted line, it, it selected the moon and you can basically 
create, just put the moon on a black background. But you need to be extremely cautious when you do that because look, it, it selected a bunch of stuff over here. So you have to be very careful to only be doing this on the limb so you don't lose data. So there's a lot of finishing touches that can go into a mosaic, but the actual initial processing steps are somewhat simple. You know, a program like Microsoft ICE does an amazing job at aligning, but not such a good job blending, and it loses data to black clipping. So if you take that result, though, from Microsoft ICE, open it in Photoshop, Photoshop does a pretty good job of blending, but definitely be careful of color space. It may work for you in sRGB, but in my images here, maybe it's just the nature of the amount of overlap we have in the images. But um, I get a lot of black clipping and weird blending artifacts. If I don't do it in linear color space, then you can blend it, add in any gamma and curves that you want, um, and black level. And so then this is kind of a finished product of the moon. So it, it looks nice at small image scales. And then of course, you know, you can find higher resolution images of the moon out there, but it's kind of cool that to, to me to have an image where you have the entire moon and you can just zoom in to to any particular point and inspect, you know, we can go up to Plato, this region here. And then at the same time that you have all the detail over near the Terminator, there is not any significant clipping. You know, if you go to Proclus, there's some clipping in the rim, but I would describe this as, depending on your point of view, non-essential highlights. Um, but that's, you know, of course, subject to personal preference. Uh, also, what I said before definitely holds true. If you want to make a cropped version of an image, you may do processing a little differently. So maybe I want an image where I rotate this and have like kind of a view flying over the limb this way. This processed version here probably is the most realistic. I mean, if, if you look at images taken from the Apollo astronauts literally holding film cameras out the window of the spacecraft, the moon kind of looks like this. It's a mix of concrete and asphalt, and it, it's pretty drab. But if you wanted to, um, you know, spice it up however you want, there's any number of alterations that you could do that, you know, might make this region of the moon look more uh, aesthetic to you. I think that looks pretty cool. I mean, there's all kinds of cool things you can do with these images. But again, if you do an alteration like this, keep in mind that that might only apply to this region because if you back it out you've lost all of your terminator detail and like you know this region here around rupus recta is now i mean almost invisible in some places and that's certainly not what it would look like by eye you would probably see something a little more like that so you know these are just the things i think about and probably for the sake of time this is a, a good place to and the presentation, because uh, there's a, a lot of other details that you could go into concerning map projections and, and that sort of thing. But if people have questions, um, I'm certainly ready to, to entertain them. But that, that's kind of the end of the, the formal presentation. Anybody have uh, any questions that they wanted to follow up uh, while we've got uh, Tom with us? So I think what you've done here, Tom, is you've given us a lot to think about as you know a group that is probably devotes ninety percent of its energy to to, to deep sky. Uh, uh, I think we're going to take and digest uh, what uh, what you've been giving us here for a while. Uh, by the way, everybody should know the the video will be saved. I will go ahead and send a, a link out to everybody so you can uh, you can watch the video uh, again uh, and Tom I'll, I'll send that off to you too okay great uh, this has uh, this has been really fascinating uh, I, I think a, a lot of us are going to uh, take a look back through this uh, and, and uh, see what we can extract from it um, uh, again I guess what I'd pass along to everybody is I started out as, as a lunar and planetary imager uh, and it's a lot easier <laughs> than deep sky imaging. So if you're doing deep sky imaging, you can definitely do lunar imaging. You may not be able to do it the way Tom can, uh, but you will find uh, that, that uh, there are a few tricks that are different, uh, but you've already got, you know, you already understand what stretching is. You already understand how to do some of those things. You already understand the basics of what stacking is all about. 
Uh, and uh, so uh, as you uh, take a dive into uh, uh, auto stacker and, and how to do the subsequent processing, you know, whether it's in Photoshop or in uh, PixInsight, I think you'll have a pretty good handle on, uh, on how to do that. I, I saw one person uh, press the raise hand button. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Well, I raised my hand about an hour ago, but if, if you're referring to someone else, I'll let them go first. I uh, don't know. Okay, but if so, anybody has a question, just go right ahead and we'll, we'll sort them out. So my, I guess I'll ask my question. It's a little bit trivial, but I, um, since I got you on, on the online here, Tom, I was going to ask you. So I have um, an ASI 120 MCS, the, the one with the... Uh, USB 3.0, like high data throughput capabilities, mm -hmm. and uh, and I use it for a guide scope when I'm doing my thing. But I use it sometimes uh -huh. with my 14-inch Dobsonian uh, yeah, with a 1650 uh, native focal length that I usually step up with a 2x uh, uh, Barlow. Uh -huh. And uh, take close-up shots of the moon and then um, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, so I was wondering. So I, I only recently discovered that I can only get a, uh, over. I can only overclock my frame rate if I'm looking at a, a region of interest. So I'm stopping. I'm looking at a, a small part of the chip. Right. And once I get the plan, planet or whatever centered, I, I go into that mode, and I found I can get like up to 150 frames per second, which is a lot for me. Usually right. I'm, I'm used to like 30, but for for lit, for more um, experienced planetary imagers, uh, I, I would imagine, yeah, you could get up into the hundreds or even a thousand frames per second. Uh, yeah, well, no, not not quite. Um, well, I do have some comments on that, but if you, I'll let you finish so, yeah, my, if there's more of a, yeah. Right, so my, my, my explicit question is, um, uh, do you think um, imaging in this way is doable you see because the dobsonian is uh, you know it sort of bounces up and down it's not really rigidly there it's just this giant scope on a dobsonian right. mount uh I, I do you think that the uh target sort of moving around constantly uh it could be a, a problem and uh, when i go to stacking and aligning frames uh so or, it, or is that okay no it, I, well there's a lot of people that image with dobsonians including untracked uh so uh, the difficulty is really a sort of one of uh, patience and manual dexterity to keep it as centered as possible. So Dobsonians in general, a couple of things I can say, S many of the people that image with Dobsonians have equatorial platforms for them. And in some cases, then they're, they're tracked. Um, and then it's really no different from uh, an equatorial mount that I use. If, however, you are, uh, using an altazimuth mount, uh, you're limited in the amount of time that you can record for because of field rotation. And I don't know what that time limit is exactly for the moon because I, I don't have a Dobsonian. I've never tried this. I know that auto stacker can account for small amounts of field rotation, but not a lot. Uh, so you may be more limited in the number of frames you can get simply because you might need to start out with something like a 30 second recording and no longer. Whereas I could record, I mean, I routinely do four minutes on the moon um, and then I have more data than I want to, I, I don't want any more data than that. So there's nothing wrong with the Dobsonian at all. You're just gonna have a little bit more frustration with your manual tracking because if you don't keep it relatively centered, Auto Stackert will hate that. Um, you kind of you can have some movement. In fact, I'm never precisely polar aligned, and I don't want to be because having a small amount of drift that during a long recording, I actually use the hand controller. Uh, I put a reticle in fire capture over a crater, and every 20 seconds or so, I use the hand controller to recenter that crater, and then I just let it have small inaccuracies for the 20 seconds or so before I center it up again. And that sort of acts as a natural type of dithering, uh, which is a good thing for planetary and lunar imaging. Uh, it, it pretty much means you don't need calibration frames is what it means. I didn't talk about that today, but I rarely use any calibration frames. It's impossible to use them for planetary imaging because you're changing your settings too much. Uh, for lunar imaging, you could, 
uh, some scopes you might want a flat field actually my my edge hd has a pretty good field so i don't i generally don't use flats but they can be useful in some scopes uh so I guess the short answer is your Dobsonian is fine, but there's going to be certain frustrations you're going to encounter uh, with manual tracking, but it's totally doable. The other thing, though, with respect to your question on frame rate, it's a little bit of a misunderstanding out there that everyone is imaging at fast frame rates. It depends on the planet. So a planet that has a very bright surface area. So Mars is a primary example. Venus is another example. You can image. I've done Mars at... Uh, over 400 frames a second because I use a very small field of view and the planet is so bright that you can do, you know, on the order of two millisecond exposures, no problem without even running a super high gain. Uh, planets like Jupiter, it's more intermediate. I usually do about a hundred frames per second on Jupiter. I don't usually like to go below a 10 millisecond exposure because the gain gets a little high for my taste. Saturn is even worse. Uh, it's even slower. Uh, you know, I had an image of, I mean, I've taken a lot of images of planets. I, I don't know how well these, you know, show up in, uh, in the Google meeting, but you know, like th this would be a prime example of, so the Mars image was probably imaged at about, I think this one was 300 and something frames a second, Jupiter at about a hundred frames per second. In Saturn, I'm usually using 25 to 35 millisecond exposures. So we're talking about, you know, usually under 40 frames a second, almost always under 50 frames a second. So it doesn't have to be super fast. It's more the quality of the data that matters. So the moon is completely different because if you're using a planetary camera on the moon, you can achieve good frame rates. But on my ASI uh, 224, for example, with a very small field of view, I use the whole sensor and it's still too small for my personal taste, but the fastest that camera can go is 150 frames a second when using the whole sensor. Uh, my ASI 183, when using the full sensor, is 19 frames a second. So all of these images that I've been showing you, I mean, you know, this image, this is just a subset of a much larger image. This is a very small subset. If you used a, a region of interest, you could get faster frame rates. But most of the time when I'm showing you images such as, as this, this is a small crop of a much larger panel of which several compile an image like this. And so I'm only imaging at 19 frames a second, which is why uh, I don't capture as many frames. But as I said too, I'm accumulating data at 20 gigabytes per thousand frames. So you're really limited in the number that you can collect anyway. So on a planetary image, collecting small numbers of frames is not so good because the planets are dim and you're using high gain and you need a deep stack to bring, uh, bring that noise down. On the moon, you don't need as many frames. Uh, I usually, if I can, I like to stack a thousand, but I've stacked as few as a hundred. Um, I mean, I've had images that look uh, about, I can't remember how many were stacked here. It was more than that, but I've had images of just a hundred frames stacked and if your exposure is somewhere up around 20 milliseconds and your gain was low, even 100 frames in a stack can look quite good. So it's definitely not the case that you need to be imaging at super fast frame rates. And in fact, on the moon, it's an impossibility for in many situations. Okay, well, uh, I wanted to say I enjoyed your talk greatly. Thank you very much for coming in. All your work is very impressive, and uh, it's inspired me to try to get back into doing a little bit more of that stuff. So thank you well, for your time. Well, well, thank you for the nice comments. And for everybody, just to keep in mind, springtime is really the time to do this, uh, because uh, the first quarter moon that has you know, a nice terminator giving you a lot of easy, high contrast detail uh, is high in the spring sky, whereas if you wait until fall, you'll find the first quarter moon is way down south. Uh, so uh, this is a this is a good time to to, uh, to to go out and do that. And so the the in the fall, it's the last quarter moon and phases like yeah. this actually. And so the painful thing there is, you know, this image was taken at four in the morning, so right. that's when the moon crosses the meridian. Then, which uh, you just. <laughs> Yeah, so there's certainly some appeal to the first quarter being at about six to anywhere from six to nine p.m. depending on your phase and your location. So, I have one quick question. Um, back at the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about that rule of thumb for getting the uh, proper focal ratio, right, uh, for sampling well. Um, 
and of course, with my gear, that would end up being right in between the two options I could actually achieve with the camera that I have, you know, or be either F20 or F25. So would you choose to err on the lower focal ratio side or the higher sampling side if you had to choose? Yeah, I would probably err on the side of lower. So, it, you know, if, so what it, you said, F, what's the, uh, what's the pixel size of your camera? 4.63, I think. Okay, so if it was 4.63, then multiplying by five is, yeah, F23. I would do F20. So what I can tell you is, um, you know, I so I'm at 2.4 microns and I'm imaging at F10. So if you were to come up with a multiplier, I'm, I'm imaging it at 4.2 times the pixel scale, not five. And I've never uh, been dissatisfied with my images. And in fact, you know, if, if I go in and measure, um, the smallest features that are fully resolved. It gets tricky with extended objects, you know, uh, riles and high contrast features, you can go well below the diffraction limit. But for actual craters that have dimension to them, um, I can get down right to about the diffraction level for my scope, which is 0 0.5 arc seconds. And that's using my slightly technically undersampled image. Uh, I see people that oversample though. So you you could go both ways. My opinion is that it's usually better to be on the lower end because the signal to noise ratio is higher in the images. And it actually, it just brings out image quality that I think can improve the result versus going in the other direction. But as I said, there's people out there that break this rule. I mean, I encounter images all the time that look really good. And then I, I look at the focal ratio and it, it looks insane, but it seems to work for them. Um, in many cases, however, those images could be downsized 50% and they don't lose any detail. So to me that, you know, I personally, if I ever see an image where it looks fantastic, but if you can reduce the size by 50% and you don't lose any meaningful detail, then to me, that was probably a case where you might've been able to do even better had you undersampled a little, reduced the gain, increased the, the image quality a bit. But these are all things that you have to determine experimentally. For yeah, yourself, but, but I, I, yeah, I personally would go on the lower side. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Anybody else have any other uh, questions for Tom? All right. Well, Tom, thanks uh, very much for taking all the time to talk to us. This is uh, this has been really helpful. Sure. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, we'll be uh, taking a look through this video uh, after us uh, as we uh, get uh, further along in uh, uh, in lunar imaging here uh, through the spring. Uh, and I will, like I said, I'll send a link out to the video as soon as uh, Google finishes compiling it for us here. Great. All right. Uh, next meeting is uh, April 24th. I think it's in the email that I sent around with uh, Chris Woodhouse, uh, who is a, a well-known uh, deep sky imager who is going to be joining us all the way over from England. Uh, so I uh, hope to see everybody then. All right. All right, everyone, stay safe. See you, see you in a while, all right? Post your images. <laughs>